Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us um, for this meeting of the Conservative European Forum. As always, I'd encourage anybody who is attending who's not yet signed up as a member of the CEF to do so. Full information about CEF and about our uh, subscriptions is on our website, um, Conservative European Forum. Um, dot org. Uh, is it dot org or dot net, Simon? Um, I can never remember. Dot com. Dot com. <laughs> dot com. Dot com. Um, but please do sign up because, um, as the supermarket slogan has it, every little helps. And uh, I think that um, there are some real opportunities at the moment for us um, within the Conservative Party and British politics more generally to press for uh, ideas about improved relationships between the United Kingdom and our democratic neighbours elsewhere in Europe. But I'm delighted that we're joined um, this evening by uh, Tom van den Kendelera, who is a um, member of the European Parliament from uh, Belgium, and he is a member of the um, CD and uh, V party, which is a, a, a Flemish or a Christian Democrat political party. Tom's going to speak to us as usual for you know, perhaps 10 minutes or however long he wants to take. We will then move to question and answers. As always, can I say to people, please indicate either by raising a virtual hand um, or by um, uh, uh, indicating in the chat function, the chat function, not the Q&A function, that you wish to take part. And I will, if the system, if the IT is working, come to you uh, and you'll be able to put your question to Tom in person. If we can't get through to you, I'll try to moderate that and read out your, your question. We will close, as always, uh, after an hour sharp. Um, I think in fairness to all our speakers, we're, we're pretty ruthless about timing. Um, Tom has had a very career, I think there's two, two terms in the in the EP, um, different times, served on various committees. Um, but I think in particular, I'd single out three items which might be of particular interest to this audience. He has chaired the uh, European Parliament delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And I think, Tom, you're going to speak mostly about sort of EU and NATO and, and the some of the issues and relationships that have uh, become even more in the spotlight since the uh, attack on Ukraine uh, just uh, under 12 months ago. But he has also been a member of the European Parliament's delegation for relations with Iran, um, a country I think we're paying too little attention to at the moment and where I think some of the risks uh, to global peace and security are graver than um, you, you would guess by looking at most newspapers or TV news bulletins. And he was also rapporteur um, on data. And I think particularly, Tom, am I right, for the uh, the data adequacy uh, uh, sort of decision by the European Union in respect of the United Kingdom, something that comes up for review like a number of key other key decisions and treaties in 2025, 2026. So it's going to be you know, on the agenda for the next European Parliament, the new commission when they're in place and for the new UK government when it is uh, uh, it is elected. Um, so, Tom, you're very, very welcome. Um, and over to you. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. David, thank you so much. And I hope everyone can hear me loud and clear. I send you my best regards from Strasbourg. And I would want to apologize, first of all, for uh, our last meeting, which unfortunately wasn't able to go through because of, uh, well, delays in discussions here and um, me being held up in uh, a coordination meeting. In fact, um, what David forgot to mention, but what I, what I kindly want to say is that I'm actually a great friend of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm a University of Kent graduate. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in Canterbury, greatly enjoyed my time there. And I am currently also the uh, secretary of the Royal Belgian Benevolent Society, which is uh, active in the UK, supporting Belgian students uh, in the UK, uh, reason for which I will be traveling to the UK uh, at the very beginning of March, uh, and I'll be glad to be back on, uh, on British soil at that, um, at that moment. Um, indeed, I will be speaking to you on NATO and EU-NATO cooperation, but I'll 
also be mentioning something on EU-UK cooperation in, in terms of security and defense. And I'll conclude by a few uh, remarks on the, on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I'll first be speaking on NATO um, because I think it is first and foremost our, uh, our most important political and military instrument that we have today to guarantee our international security and defense policy. And I think that is precisely also the reason why I already want to say at this stage that it needs to be incessantly reinforced in order to adequately deal both with old but also with new challenges, obviously. I think when we talk about reinforcing NATO and, and EU-NATO cooperation, automatically we can talk about reinforcing EU-UK cooperation in the field of foreign security and defense policy. Um, and I think strengthening NATO and strengthening EU uh, defense policy by no means contradict each other. So I'll be talking about that as well. Um, and indeed, I'll be making the case later on for a reinforced EU-UK security and defense cooperation, which I think would be reciprocally beneficial and indeed benefit uh, to NATO as well. So first, let me kick off with my first part of my intervention on EU-NATO. I think what we saw last year was a spectacular and ex accelerating expan expansion of security challenges and corresponding increase of political awareness and commitments to adequately deal with them. Obviously, the, the start of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine in February last year, we'll be soon celebrating, unfortunately, the first anniversary of it has given a very strong impetus and in processes that were already ongoing both in NATO and in the EU with regard to upgrading and updating their security and defense policy. And two uh, documents stand out uh, particularly in that regard. On the European side, we've seen the adoption of the EU strategic compass in March, 2022. I think this document, the strategic compass, has really been a game changer uh, and reflects very much how CSDP has become an EU priority over the past year. It contains, and I would invite you to have a look at it uh, or Google it uh, after uh, this meeting is over, it contains um, to European standards or to European defence standards uh, a large number of far-reaching commitments and operational measures, very concrete measures, some 80 actions, um, and concrete timelines also for it, which I think stands for a substantial upgrade of our common security and defense policy on the basis of updated th threat analyses. It has, and that is important to note, been adopted unanimously by all member states, um, and its implementation will be monitored as always by the European Commission, but also by Council and Parliament. Uh, I think that is uh, important because it will be all about implementation, obviously. Now, this document focuses on, on four points, and I think each of them, you will easily be able to imagine uh, what the repercussions uh, of, these, um, of these four priorities are. First of all, um, we want to be able to act and react rapidly and robustly wherever a crisis erupts with partners, if possible, and alone when necessary. Secondly, the document says that we want to enhance our ability to anticipate threats, including all kinds of hybrid threats, and secure access to strategic maritime, air, and space domains. Thirdly, the document says that we want to invest more and better in capabilities and innovative technologies, fill strategic gaps, and reduce technological and industrial dependencies. And fourthly and lastly, the document says that we want to strengthen our cooperation with partners to address common threats and challenges uh, in this case, we talk about multilateral cooperation with NATO and indeed bilateral cooperation with, for example, the United Kingdom. So I think if you think about these four priorities listed in the strategic compass, we can talk about the major step forward in our European Defence Union, which still has a very long way ahead. We need to be honest with each other, but it enables the EU to act as an effective security provider and hopefully at one day uh, an assertive global actor as well. I think, in a way, this document and its adoption in March 2022 perfectly responded to the sense of urgency imposed by the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. So it was, in a way, the right move at the right moment for the EU to take. A second document that stands out in the course of last year was the, the adoption of the NATO strategic doc, uh, concept in June 2022. 
this document in a way resets um, the, the NATO cooperation in order to be able to better cope with a broader range of challenges and threats. And it has in a way a confirmation of the basic objectives, but also of the political commitments and uh, a confirmation also of the strong ambitions NATO has. To me, it was very good that there was an affirmation of uh, its strong cooperation wish with the European Union, because effectively that is uh, here in the European Parliament what we're always looking for. And obviously there was the context of the Swedish and Finnish uh, NATO uh, accession application. I think it gives an important uh, supplementary advantage in the fact that it literally um, enlarges the common ground of EU and NATO, uh, which will strengthen NATO, but which I hope would also have a strong impact uh, on EU-NATO cooperation uh, in the future. And then there was a third document, uh, which was adopted only last month. Uh, and for that reason, David, it would have been great if we could have spoken last month, but it was effectively my mistake. Um, there was the adoption of the third EU-NATO joint declaration um, adopted in, in January. So that document, in fact, didn't have anything new in my view. And, and there was no surprise in that text but indeed it was a welcome update of political commitments and an equivocal confirmation of the strong partnership with obviously particular attention to Russia as a challenging aggressor and importantly with uh, China being mentioned as a strategic competitor. The document that the uh, joint declaration called for closer cooperation linking NATO strategic concept and the EU strategic compass because in, in effect this hadn't happened yet there was no on paper confirmation of these two documents being linked um, and indeed in that regard taking the ambition to the next uh, partnership level if you may. The document also specified the nature of uh, the partnership of the scope of the magnitude of challenges and increasing the depth and breadth of, of cooperation and it's recognized the value of more and stronger European uh, defense which I think is effectively very necessary uh, today. Um, but also it endorsed um, and I think this document will be carried by the United Kingdom as well. So NATO, in a way, if you think about it, offers the adequate framework for our cooperation between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Last month, as David already highlighted, um, we adopted the Common uh, Security and Defense Policy Annual Report for which I was a rapporteur and therefore the responsible person in, in Parliament. And I think this document reflected and confirms what I already came to mention and was uh, either mentioned in the EU strategic compass or in the NATO strategic concept or effectively in the EU uh, NATO joint declaration. But indeed, it went a bit further. And I think that is, if you want where the next steps of the European Union would be, I think those would be the steps you want to, uh, you want to take note of. There are some seven points. First of all, um, I think we entirely and timely want to see an implementation of that strategic compass and of those ambitions mentioned there. As you very well know, we don't have a lack of uh, paper declarations uh, in Europe. And I think really, if we want to do something about security and defense, we need to uh, put our mouth where, our, no, put our money where our mouth is. Is that correct? Um, so we want to see that implementation of everything that has been agreed upon in that strategic compass. Secondly, we want to see as a first major step forward the operationalization of the EU's rapid deployment capacity. Some 5,000 troops um, stationed on a permanent basis. I think that is that would be a major step forward for us and indeed a very visible step forward for all Europeans that we can start talking seriously about European defense. Thirdly, we uh, mentioned in our annual report as a parliament, the absolute need to reinforce industrial and technological base of our European defense. It is something at NATO Sec Gen Stoltenberg hinted at yesterday as well. And I think we will agree all in this meeting that um, we have to do something also about our industrial base if we want to keep up with the, uh, the level of challenges that we see in, in Ukraine today. Fourthly, um, and that is something typically European, uh, but you'll remember it from back in the day. We absolutely need to increase our financial means, both in European budgets and in national budgets when we talk about defense capacity. Fifthly, I think uh, we need to do something about our resilience when it comes to hybrid warfare. Um, we have seen both with migrants being unleashed at the Belarusian border, but also with cyber attacks in the past months and years, how, um, how weak we are effectively as Europeans. So we need a common threat analysis. We need 
an intellig a better intelligence sharing, uh, a cybersecurity um, strategy that is really worth uh, that that name, um, a protection, a better protection of our critical infrastructure, and indeed the fight also against foreign disinformation campaigns and interference in our democratic processes. Sixthly, um, when we talk about common foreign, uh, common security and defense policy, we need to talk about decision making in the EU as well. And I think one of the frustrations uh, on both sides of the channel has been the the eternal decision making processes, uh, in no way going forward quickly enough to be able to to talk about ambition uh, in security and defense policy. And I think. Um, at least we need to start credi credibly exploring options uh, to that end. Uh, I'm very happy to see discussions ongoing on qualified majority uh, decision making, um, but we're not there yet and no way near there yet. Um, and the seventh remark I wanted to make uh, is on um, upgrading and that is a wish uh, and it would be wrong if I didn't talk about it, uh, upgrading the role of the European Parliament in common security and defense policy. Um, with regard both to decision making but also to implementation uh, including dialogue and cooperation with national parliaments. Now um, I will, uh, if you allow me David, move to my second part uh, which is on EU-UK cooperation in the light let's say of uh, or in the broader NATO context. I think um, it speaks for itself the UK has always been a key player when it comes to dealing with security and defense issues not only in the European regional context but far beyond that and Brexit, in a way, hasn't had the best of impacts uh, on both the potential and the ambitions of the EU as a global security provider. Uh, and the UK, too, I think, has lost significant leverage um, when it comes to um, defend its own security interests worldwide. But no harm is done. Uh, and I want to be clear about that. If um, cooperation becomes substantial and if it were to be able to reach the level of a high performance partnership, by the way, I've, I've noticed that about 70% of the British population would wish to see a clo closer cooperation also uh, on the, not only in that regard, but also in that regard. I don't think, uh, by the way, or moreover, that um, our cooperation should be limited to security and defense policy. I think cooperation could go beyond that and could be related to foreign and security policy in general and shouldn't perhaps all, not only be about NATO, but could also be about transatlantic relations in all of its aspects and dimensions. And I think the UK is, a, is, a, is an excellent partner uh, between the, the two blocks uh, in that regard. And I have repeatedly uh, pleaded uh, also here in this house in favor of strengthening cooperation, including the creation of an institutional framework to manage and to permanently activate it. Uh, we know each other very well. We are NATO allies. We have more or less the same security and other challenges and threats, and we share the same interests and values um, to build on a common foreign security and defense policy on, within and uh, beyond NATO. I think of the United Nations, I think of G7 and other formats. And I think um, if we were to come uh, to a, um, let's say, smooth solution in terms of the Brexit agreements, uh, which I could only hope for, I think the EU would be very eager to set up a structured cooperation or at least a structured dialogue, uh, but unavoidably uh, that would have to be um, uh, the wish on your side as well for that matter. But whether we like it or not, we remain natural partners um, and our relations should be strengthened in my view by more investing in mutual understanding and confidence. We see that, um, or at least I find it important that recently the UK has also asked for more structured cooperation on many issues relating to foreign and security policy. And Prime Minister Sunak, more than his predecessors, seems to leave the necessary room, in my view, for progress uh, in the ongoing negotiations with regard to the upgrade uh, of a cooperation. What we see in the meantime is that, in fact, there is a regular and ad hoc contact between EEAS and the UK uh, on a very pragmatic uh, approach basis. And I think that is positive and we can only be very happy about that in terms of our mutual security. Contacts and cooperation on issues uh, with particular importance such as the Russian war of aggression, obviously, uh, such as also the including the coordination on sanctions, but also uh, threats and challenges in the Sahel region, um, Chinese rivalry uh, and security challenges in the Indo-Pacific. I'll, I'll give two examples on this pragmatic and ad hoc cooperation. I think over the last weeks, 
the first example, allies have shown continued de determination to increase military support by endorsing the so-called Talon Pledge, uh, by showing resolve in Ramstein, or indeed, in the case of Germany, by finally boarding after days of hesitations with regard to uh, the sending of tanks. Um, but also, for example, second example, in December last year, uh, leaders and representatives of a significant number of NATO allies um, have uh, adopted the NATO-related Joint Expeditionary Force uh, statement containing clear commitments to deal with a range of security challenges and um, relating to increased Russian military activity in the high north, the North Atlantic and the Baltic Sea region to indeed um, accelerate cooperation both in dealing with hybrid threats but also in focusing on uh, subsea data uh, and energy infrastructure intelligence sharing. And there, uh, United Kingdom was and is very prominently involved in both in both documents, in fact, in Talent Pledge and in the Jeff Leaders Statement. And I think that means there is critical mass enough to promote cooperation between the EU on the one hand and uh, you as a very important NATO ally in the area of uh, security and defense policy and to indeed uh, eventually institutionally anchor this, this cooperation. Now, on uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, I think uh, when you look at the EU, we have kind of um, went above and beyond what everyone would have been able to expect. I think um, in the EU, even last week's European Council still uh, confirmed this. We've delivered unprecedented political, economic, financial, military, and humanitarian support uh, to the Ukrainians while indeed unleashing heavy rounds of sanctions um, on Russia to cripple uh, their economy. In, in a way, uh, the, the Europeans have managed to break their own taboos uh, in a record speed time. Um, for example, we've, we've, we've financed uh, uh, joint efforts by member states to deliver military uh, equipment, uh, including lethal and heaven, uh, heavy weaponry. Um, if you look at, for example, the Ramstein uh, Security Conference or Defense Co Conference, uh, or if you look, for example, also at the European Parliament support for the so-called Kiev Security Compact, guaranteeing sustained military support uh, for Ukrainians uh, to, to foresee their successful uh, self-defense, I think you really can talk about uh, breaking taboos at a record speed time. Um, as important as supporting Ukraine, Ukraine, um, Ukrainians may be, I think what we what we constantly feel uh, among European member states and among this throughout discussions here also in the European Parliament, is that we have to take into account the budgetary burden. For a country like Belgium, this is indeed a source of concern. Um, but we also have to take into, into account the political and societal acceptability of efforts uh, in their own country. And I think we're not definitely not reaching that stage yet, but um, we might reach that stage at some point, uh, especially when the war could become a very protracted um, event. The question I want to put forward for the discussion later on is how far we can go without provoking rather than slowing down escalation, obviously. Um, and my fear is that neither uh, Ukraine nor Russia will be a quick winner uh, in this conflict. I mean, we want to do everything we can to make that happen, or at least to make the Ukrainian part side win. Um, but in the best scenario, we might end up with a, or in the worst scenario, we might end up with a frozen conflict for many years with both with a strong impact on both EU and on NATO, um, and on also Ukraine's uh, prospects to join uh, either of these uh, organizations at some point in the future. On um, perhaps a European membership of Ukraine, because I want already to uh, respond to a question that might pop up later on in that regard, I think we need to give Ukraine a credible and encouraging perspective to join the EU when the time is ripe, but obviously valid criteria and procedures have to be applied as much for Ukraine as they apply uh, for all other candidate countries. I don't think there is a political or a legal base at this stage for a fast track EU membership. Um, and again, this has been confirmed by the EU Council last week. David, I'll conclude by saying two things more. I think as you heard, heard my plea, there is um, a very fertile ground in a way for the shared interests and values and, and the past we share to come to a more um, ambitious partnership and strong cooperation in the future. And um, I think at this stage, I would also want to repeat perhaps my plea for the establishment of a NATO center for democratic resilience to not only identify challenges, but also facilitate democratic governance assistance with regard to tackling uh, or to defending our democracies as they will become more and more under fire in the, in the years to come. 
thank you very much for your attention. Tom, thank you very much indeed. That, that was very stimulating. I have got um, a number of questions already and I uh, invite other colleagues to submit theirs as well. Um, can I go first to Gunther Fellinger, please? Simon, have we got Gunter online? If not, I will have to. He should be online, but if you want to perhaps come back to him. Okay, come back to Gunter. Anatra Moraes, please. Hi, thank you, David. Thank you, Tom, for a, a most insightful um, allocution. Uh, my question is on one one of the issues uh, that has come to the fore probably more and more as the uh, implication in terms of military material uh, provisions to Ukraine uh, has gone more to the fore, that is whether there are or can there be uh, any plans across the EU and across NATO to replenish uh, the arsenals uh, which are being depleted uh, in the to the war and are there policies that can be expedite the increase of weapons production capacity and factory uh, repurposing and because the thing is that what, what I feel sometimes is that there is a lack of kind of uh, wartime awareness uh, in some in some respect and if I if I may just uh, add to uh, Another, another question is that uh, in the last hours, uh, it seems that the situation in Moldova has uh, become uh, more, more unstable. And the thing is that uh, I don't know if you have any, any views on that. And the thing is that the possibility that elements in other uh, candidate countries uh, may be part of that destabilization in, in Moldova. Thank you. Actually, on, on Moldova, before you reply, Tom, can I just um, bring in Ad, Ad, Azia Odrezola as well, please? Oh, hi there. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tom. Very eloquent, very clear, very insightful. Now, my question is, um, recently, the prime minister in Moldova declare that uh, there are some threats that Putin is trying to destabilize Moldova. Now, if Putin was successful in this respect, because obviously he's got troops in the Transnistria, that would be, um, that would represent a dent on European security. And if that was so, what would the EU and NATO do about it? And also, you just mentioned the issue of the conflict uh, possibly getting frozen. Now, as we know, uh, Putin, uh, I, I think William Hague mentioned that Putin is a, a black belt, judo black belt uh, player. And one of his, the things that he normally tends to do is to try to disable the opponent's capability to respond. If that's the case, a frozen conflict would mean that he wins. And if he wins, we all lose. Don't we? Tom. Thank you, David, and thank you, Azir and um, Nacho, for your uh, for your questions. I think first, starting off with Moldova, um, we're very right. I think we share the same concerns with regard to um, to, to what is happening there. I think um, we need all support possible for Maya Sandu uh, to to get a, a new government going and to uh, protect itself as, as strong as possibly as possible uh, against what is what is happening or, or the way in which uh, the Russians are attacking them. In a way, um, I, cons I consider them very much on the same line as uh, what we need to do for the Ukrainians and what are we are doing for the Ukrainians. So to me, in terms not only of, of EU candidates um, or the EU membership perspective, but also the way in which we, we feel about them uh, and uh, they, we, we very much have the same concerns, but also the same commitments towards them. Um, so whatever is happening, I think the EU would have to respond um, in the same way as we have been um, doing uh, in Ukraine. 
because we cannot afford to just uh, give Moldova away, if I may put it that impolitely. Um, by the way, uh, as much as Ukraine, uh, Moldova is also bordering uh, European borders. So I think it is it is not an option to to have any other scenario than to keep Moldova supporting as much um, as as necessary. Mm. Um, now, um, with regard, uh, Arya, as here to uh, to your um, frozen conflict remark, I think you are very right. Um, if Putin were to end up with a frozen conflict, it would be more of a win for him than it would be for us, because effectively uh, this would leave Ukraine as a um, country, a, a broken country, um, a country which couldn't go forward um, and which couldn't pursue its its European um, membership uh, in, in any case, as long as the borders of the country aren't, aren't stabilized. Um, so in that regard, um, Indeed, we cannot afford to end up in a frozen conflict, but that will mean uh, political support, uh, sustained political support, and equals uh, sustained democratic support by our joint populations to, to keep doing what we're doing, um, even if we're talking about um, more than just months and indeed years uh, to come. Uh, and that will be a challenge for all of us, uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure. On um, replenishing the gaps, um, well, uh, it, it is quite um, timely uh, to ask that question in the sense that we uh, here in, in the European Parliament, we're working on, uh, indeed, the full name is the EU Defence Industry Reinforcement Through Common Procurement Act, uh, easily uh, summarised to EDERPA. And um, EDERPA is, in fact, the instrument which we want, which is one of the first pieces of European legislation coming out of the strategic compass and which indeed puts into legislative words um, our ambition to do procurement, defense procurement in a joint way. Now, um, it might not be a good signal that the parliament in effect is already taking much longer than it should to get this act passed through parliament. Um, I think we need speed above all if we want to get things in place as quickly as possible. And what I pick up from member states, including my own, is that whenever uh, replenishing gaps have to happen, they pass through the NATO procurement uh, system effectively. Um, now, it is good that uh, member states and allies of NATO um, act pragmatically and pass through the NATO procurement system uh, to do so. But indeed, I think if we today are at 11% uh, 11 11 joint procurement only in the European Union of our um, military uh, and defense material, I think we have to do a lot better in in um, procuring jointly, and indeed we have to do so by um, by by streamlining this, by coordinating this in a in a much better way. And to that end, mm -hmm. this um, this common procurement act that is on that is coming up, uh, I think would be a bit would be a good thing to have, but we need it rather sooner than later. Back to you, David. Thanks very much indeed. Um, can I go next to Robert Morland and then after Robert to Keith Best, please, and then to John Bowis. Robert. You're muted, Robert. That's it. Robert, we still can't hear you, I'm afraid. Can you can you just try muting yourself and unmuting yourself again? I'm afraid uh, I'm afraid that's still not not working at all. We'll come we'll try and come back to you or, or if you type it in, I'll I will read it out. Let's go let's go to Keith, please. Uh John, thank you very much for a very, <clears throat> as David said, stimulating talk. You obviously have an enormous amount of knowledge and expertise in, in both NATO and the EU. I mean, my, my question, I come from a, a military background my, myself in airborne and commando forces, as, as well as political one. But uh, the whole question of whether there is, in your view, a common perception amongst uh, EU countries as to what 
the next threat or the likely threat is going to be. Is it going to be cyber warfare? Is mm -hmm. it going to be uh, uh, terrorist uh, attacks? Is state-sponsored terrorism? Mm -hmm. um, do we need multiple rocket, rocket launch systems? I mean, is it going to be land warfare again? Uh, I mean, all these things, they're, they're all very competing interests and with limited budgets in the military. I mean, one has to be quite careful about where those that, that those resources go. So I, that's my first question really is, you know, is, is there a, a common perception? And if so, is there an opportunity there to actually ensure that different European countries will spend their resources concentrating on different aspects in so far as the answer is likely to be more than just one? Uh, and, and to see if we can proceed along those lines, or is that just stretching um, uh, European cooperation to its uh, ridiculous limits? Tom, go ahead, please. It's all right. Thanks, thanks, Keith, for uh, for your question. When I when I first saw popping it up, I, I was indeed thinking about which one would be ranked first uh, among all of the threats that uh, we we both are facing uh, on a, on a on a very uh, well uh, in a very quick or, or swift tempo. Um, but if you if you wanted to ask me to pick one out, it would be hybrid threats and hybrid warfare. Uh, we see it is fully ongoing. Um, cyber, well, uh, cyber attacks are, are there, um, and I think we need, if we wanted to focus on one thing uh, as Europeans and, and perhaps even indeed uh, in a NATO context, um, the threat analysis or hybrid threat analysis would be, would be my, my biggest wish. Um, why am I saying this? Uh, not only because Jens Stoltenberg indeed repeated that uh, cooperation needed to increase in terms of hybrid uh, threats, um, and indeed, because of um, this particular point also being highlighted in the third uh, joint declaration of EU and NATO, um, but also because um, we are struggling uh, among member states to not only um, agree to what is a hybrid threat, but also to define the actions that need to be linked to a hybrid threat. And I think the... Um, the discussion uh, around the migrants being sent to the Belarusian border, Belarusian Polish border, uh, was a very good example of that. In in no time, Germany closed down its border with Poland because they thought, oh, migrants are coming up. It's another migration problem. Uh, Polish um, were asking for our help, and we didn't really know what, what it was. Um, and that is just one. Uh, and I'm not even talking about other types of, of, um, of hybrid threats we're facing. So I think that is the one we should focus on. Um, and other than that, there is there is obviously there are obviously other other aspects um, I think we would want to focus on. Um, but if only having an agreement to come to joint definitions of threats, I think that would already be a very successful step forward. Uh, let's put baby steps forward rather than uh, major leaps um, and, and losing half of the bunch in the meantime. Um, that I think would be, David, my, uh, my response to that question of key. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to John Bowes. And after John, 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 can we try Robert Morland again, please? Um, and then Sandra Kaduri. right at the beginning of this meeting and that's the question of Iran and knowing Tom has an interest and knowledge experience of Iran I'd be grateful for your um, assessment Tom uh, we've seen although it's gone off the front pages um, in recent days because, largely because of Turkey and Syria and so on uh, but we've seen in the run-up to that um, very large demonstrations courageous demonstrations uh, responded to by the hangings and, and so forth. Uh, but it seems to be that the opposition is growing in, in Iran and more more, this, more outspoken vociferous. And I wonder if you think we are moving towards some sort of regime change or moderation, or whether you think they'll go back into their old bad ways of authoritarianism. Tom. Yep, um, that's definitely a difficult question. I mean, or a difficult topic indeed to um, to handle. In fact, I need to be honest with you. I am member of that delegation uh, because it's a, a delegation meant to have relations uh, with Iran, 
but I have never been turning up uh, to that meeting or to those meetings because I think relations with Iran are uh, particularly troublesome, uh, to be honest. Now, um, what to say about it? I, I think um, they they clearly play a role uh, in in the conflict, in the ongoing conflict in in Ukraine, um, and we cannot deny and should not deny that and should should focus on it um, because that is obviously an important factor whenever we're talking about the JCPOA and whether or not to return to the negotiations and indeed to try and, and look for a deal uh, with the Iranians on it. Um, I'm very doubtful about the perspectives of uh, a JCPOA with, with Iran. Um, but uh, let's see let's see how uh, how the high representative thinks about that and another think about that i think we need to keep up with our act with our ongoing sanctions to iran and indeed look for ways in where we can increase them i think only last month uh, here in the european parliament we adopted again a resolution calling for extra sanctions uh, focused on those um on those uh attacking citizens obviously um, and I also want to to focus perhaps or, or say one word on um, Iran's role in the Middle East peace process or at least its its effect on the situation in the Middle East um, I'm working uh, or trying to follow as much as possible also what is going on in, in Lebanon and if you see the way in which Iran is involved in in Hezbollah or at least seems to be sponsoring Hezbollah uh, but also seems to be a reason for instability in, in, in the broader region, I think we cannot be happy to put it very lightly um, about, about Iran's uh, role and its perspective and its activities uh, there too. And I think for us, at least Europeans, even if our full focus is now on Ukraine, we definitely shouldn't lose out of sight uh, the Middle East peace process, obviously, uh, and events are happening there. Thanks very much. Let's try Robert uh, Molland again, please. I hope you can hear me now. That's very good. Right. Um, and I do apologise, microphone problems. Um, it is quite, my, I really have four words to ask you about. The first two are the United States, which you didn't really touch on. But is the United, do you expect the United States to be a catalyst in getting some of the things that you would like to have done, done? Like the United States would like countries to pay more, for, for example. And I wonder if the... You know, they are needed to come in with a stronger voice with some countries in, for example, Germany. And the other uh, two words are former Yugoslavia. In the sense we've rather ignored this, and I would have thought if I was the former Yugoslavia states at the moment, I would be a bit worried about the attention being given to uh, the Ukraine coming into uh, the EU. Um, not that I disagree with what you say about what really is behind it, but in the sense that actually we should be doing more to get them in the position to come into the European Union. Yeah, good questions indeed. And um, um, I hadn't, now, now I come to realize that I didn't mention the US I think once in, in, my, um, in my opening remarks and that that definitely wasn't on purpose. Um, I think it only says that I have so much to say about what is happening in Europe, uh, finally, after a long waiting time, um, that that's the reason why. Now, um, responding to your question, I think the US can be a catalyst, um, but has to be careful about the role it, it plays. Um, because let's be honest, the Europeans know themselves very well what they need to do and what they're expected to do and what they have been committing to do uh, over the past few months and, and, and years. And um, the fact of the US coming in time and again to, to um, push the button and say, well, guys, this is now the time to do it, I think doesn't seem to have any, doesn't seem to have had any very positive effects, uh, neither very negative effects, uh, simply um, I would want the European member states to be focusing on what they have to do and, and try and get the, or keep the discussion as clean as possible from, from interference in that regard. Now, um, that doesn't mean that the United States isn't playing a crucial role, I think, in getting the discussion forward and helping the discussion forward. Uh, if only the Ramstein uh, initiative, uh, I think, luckily, we have the, the Americans in this whole, um, in this whole war. 
um, because it is, it is only thanks to them that we can also um, uh, play that role and, and help Ukrainians effectively. Um, but I think the, the whole discussion of the tanks lately, uh, the fact that the German chancellor uh, waited up until the moment where he got the, the, the US across the bridge to send tanks to, I think is, is quite symbolic for the way in which we have to be very careful about, and the Americans have to be very careful about play, which role they want to play. Um, I think they could be a, a catalyst in, in that way, but I don't think they can keep playing that card um, uh, uh, every time again um, to, to try and, and corner us into a position where we, uh, where we want to. I mean, we have to be adults enough ourselves to, to provide the help we uh, requested and we committed to. Um, on um, former Yugoslavia, uh, Yugoslavia, um, I'm not a particular specialist of the area, to be honest. The only thing I would want to say is that I'm very worried about Serbia and that I think Serbia has to speak out clearly about which path it is choosing for its future. Um, so far, we've been, see we've been seeing mixed messages. We've been seeing pro-Russian um, pro pro -Russian demonstrations in the street of Belgrade. We have at the same time seen that they want don't want to step away from the European path. Well, I think it is time for Russia, to, uh, for uh, Serbia to speak up uh, and, and, and choose its path. With regard to membership perspectives of, um, of some of the, the countries of the area, uh, you're very right. Um, and I think that is the main argument why I said in my opening remarks that we can't fast track uh, Ukrainian EU membership. Um, because what signal would you be sending to those countries, uh, those countries that have been in the waiting room for a long time? Um, I don't think we can allow ourselves, um, if we want to be taken seriously with regard to our accession process, I don't think we can allow ourselves to just bypass um, the Balkan countries and, and say, well, uh, you guys will have to wait for a little bit longer, but Ukraine will, um, we give them a special uh, status. I hope it was clear. Thanks. Um, Sandra Kadori. Yes, hi. Thank you very much, David. Um, my name's Sandra from Keeping Channels Open, a new dialogue forum. Um, given that the UK is now really worried about being left behind and, and this, these alleged secret summits they've been having, um, is it up to the EU to improve its offer to the UK on defence? Because the UK complained about the offer for third countries. Or is it up to the UK to make more proposals? And secondly, the UK says it can be nimbler, bolder, uh, quicker on foreign policy and defence than the EU. So is there any truth to that? And is there new learning that UK can bring to the table now it's been on the outside for quite a while and got involved with AUKUS and all that? Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I'm also part of the EU-UK delegation. I mean, we have a, an established uh, parliamentary dialogue system now between uh, uh, the House, the House of Commons, and and the European Parliament, and uh, in fact, it is it is often the question I ask: uh, who is the one, who is the first one to cross the bridge and to 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 try and come forward? Um, and I'll be political in my answer. I think it really is a two-way street, uh, and every and both have to have to kind of move at the same time. I do think the offer of the Europeans is there, um, and. But, but we keep we keep uh, waving uh, the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement, you know, at you. And I don't think that is a particularly uh, uh, fruitful way of trying to get move things forward. At the same time, I think um, I was very disappointed when I um, I asked the question, and the British minister at the time said, "Well, we haven't." We have an ad hoc cooperation with each other, um, and that should be sufficient for now because it seems to be working well. Um, I mean. There is a bit of willingness on both sides, which should uh, which should come up, um, and I think the whole context of the difficult Brexit negotiations hasn't helped to that. But I'm very optimistic, in fact, um, that with or under Prime Minister Sunak, we can see effectively that that optimism in our relationship coming, uh, and therefore to to see um, to see both uh, in in a bit of a more of a cooperative spirit. With regard to your second question uh, on uh, the UK's claims to be nimbler, quicker, and bolder, well, I think um, has ever the UK been um, slowed down by European decision making when it came to defence uh, decisions and foreign policy decisions? I could well imagine situations, uh, and David Lillington will be able to to give more um, empirical evidence here. 
but I could well imagine situations where the European context has indeed uh, perhaps slowed down thinking about decisions to be taken and, and um, has given extra input into decision making, which has, has had its reason to make things more difficult. But effectively, no one has held you back of, of taking decisions uh, in a quicker way. I do think that um, Brexit has at least given you the impression that you can take decisions in a quicker way. Um, but I haven't seen the difference uh, today yet. Um, but maybe they are coming up. I don't know. Um, but I'll I'll be happy to hear uh, David responding on that question Thanks. as well. <laughs> Thank you. We'll have to go when I'm next in Brussels or Strasbourg, Tom. We can we can swap <laughs> notes on, on on that. Now I have three further questioners, and we have seven minutes. So what I'm going to do is ask each questioner to put his question um, succinctly, please, to Tom, and then Tom to answer. So. I'm going to go in turn through, I've got um, Peter, Oliver, and then Gunter Fellinger again. So if we go to Peter first of all, please. Thank you, Tom. Um, clearly America and other countries are worried about hostage taking in Russia, uh, which is presumably behind the call to leave the country. It seems strange to, to us that there are some extended family members of sanctioned oligarchs and others who are sort of walking around in Europe and enjoying villas. I mean, what, what is going on here? Why are these people uh, allowed to, to do this? It seems extraordinary. Thank you. Oliver? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, how do you see the, uh, the impasse over Sweden, Sweden's membership of NATO uh, being resolved with Turkey? And is there a role for the EU to help reach a resolution? So uh, uh, obviously with in mind, uh, with mind that uh, Sweden is a member of ECHR. Uh, and do you see that as a stumbling, stumbling block in itself? Uh, to, to <laughs> Turkey's request to um, return the uh, Kurdish activists. Thank you. And then Gunther. Yeah, Gunther here. I'm Austrian NATO activist, and it would help me if Ireland and Malta would join NATO because then these neutralists are a little bit uh, lonelier in Austria. So my question <laughs> is if there is some movement in the UK to ask the Irish and the Maltese who both are very close to the UK to join. And ultimately, my aim is the EU to join uh, the NATO summit to prepare the way for the UK to return to the European yeah. Union. Thanks. I'll just say, take good, before we go to top, I suspect that uh, Irish politics is such that um, a public suggestion from the UK that Ireland join NATO is probably not going to get the outcome that you and I both might both want to see. But it's interesting <laughs> that Senegal politicians like Simon Coveney have begun to speculate publicly about what Irish neutrality means when in practice the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy have responsibility for Ireland's uh, uh, security. Um, Tom, those three questions, please. Well, that is indeed saving the best for the last, if you ask me. Um, Peter, on the, on the Red Notices question, I think um, there is already a series of measures that have been taken going in, in that direction, but you're quite right uh, that much can still, more can still be done. And I think the 10th san sanctions package is coming up, is being discussed as we speak. Um, the question will be if it is if it is in there or if uh, it will indeed be um, part of the, of the measures after that. But you're right in the sense that um, whatever we're doing in terms of sanctions we have to to start looking for the gaps in our sanctions and the way in which uh, we are still leaving up loopholes or leaving open loopholes that obviously are, uh, are very much exploited by the russians um, and there is a work to be done there um, even with the seizure of of uh, luxury properties uh, we've seen we, we're seeing the same discussion Questions in a way, and in Belgium, the, the topic of diamonds is 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 another one, which is a very sensitive one. But I, th I think where we have to go forward, and we, where we have to be much more effective, uh, and indeed uh, clear uh, to each other. Oliver on Turkey. Um, well, with three minutes left, <laughs> uh, that's not an easy one. But I think um, 
I'm very much concerned, obviously, of the way in which uh, Turkey is is playing a decisive role there. And I think uh, if only one thing I had to say, it, it would be that the American impact will be decisive for what is going to happen there. Um, I am hopeful that um, the, the Finnish and Swedish uh, application to NATO won't be a a year-long thing and could indeed proceed uh, swiftly because there is this momentum and we cannot afford uh, also vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, we cannot afford to just uh, keep keep wasting our time uh, on that. But uh, you're right, it is definitely not an easy an easy case and Russia, um, Turkey is playing its role to the fullest there. On uh, Ireland, Austria and Malta, um, well, they are not, not members yet. Uh, we all know um, how difficult um, it is, and at some point not, because I was uh, positively surprised by the Finnish and the Swedes. Um, I think, to me, uh, Ireland and, and Austria seem to be opening up, let's say, to giving in, uh, and indeed joining NATO, uh, I think, at some point, because the, the discussions David referred to are a very clear example of, of the way in which spirits are um, are revolving and, and people are uh, are talking, mm -hmm. um, but a lot also will will depend on on uh, on the events in a way. Um, what will be the future of the Russian Ukraine conflict, or at least of the Russian war in Ukraine? Um, might this allow might this allow us to indeed take that quantum leap forward and uh, get those countries uh, across the bridge? But, and I'll leave, uh, or I finish there, I think um, Cyprus is obviously uh, the major issue um, in, in NATO today. Uh, the Cyprus-Turkish conflict, Cypriot-Turkish conflict, I think, is, uh, is decisive for the future of NATO. And uh, mm -hmm. let's hope we could see progress uh, there too at some point in time. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's one minute to six, so uh, one is seven um, UK time. Um, you, it'll be an hour later for, for, for you in Strasbourg. So um, I, we, we must um, say thank you very much indeed. Um, I've been really um, struck by the, I mean, the, the depth of knowledge that you have shown us this evening in, in, in responding to so many diverse questions about um, you, not just EU, NATO, but EU um, the foreign security and defence policies more generally and for your very clear um, and continuing commitment to working to improve relationships between uh, the United Kingdom and our friends and next door neighbours in the European Union. Um, I am personally um, encouraged by what I hear coming out of the Sunak government, both what is written in some of the newspapers and also what I pick up talking to some of my former colleagues who are still in government and parliament. Um, there's many a slip um, between cup and lip as the old, the old proverb would put it. Um, and I don't want to um, you know, sound over optimistic because yeah. politics sometimes gets in the way, but I think six and a half years on from our referendum, um, it is high time that um, we got or we were able in the UK to get on with the job of talking to our European friends and colleagues about a new different type of partnership. The events of 2022, Putin's further aggression against Ukraine, his challenge to the values of democracy, human rights and the rule of law, um, national self-determination that all of us throughout democratic Europe have committed ourselves to, which have been the foundation of our, our peace and security since 1945. Um, you know, China's dual role as a huge opportunity for European business, but a, uh, a, a, a with an ambition to dominate all the key 21st century technologies by 2049. The continuing uh, turbulence and uh, disorder in Europe's neighbourhood, both in the Western Balkans and in Africa. And these are all powerful imperatives for us to find new ways of working collaboratively together in the future to defend common interests and to uh, meet common challenges and threats. Thank you, Tom, very much for speaking to us this evening. We wish you and your colleagues well, and we hope that we can maintain this contact in the months and years ahead. Thank you very much. I declare the meeting closed.